the Caledonian Boar, part two. Don't worry about that part two. If you missed part one, we'll get you caught up pretty quick. Impending evil, friendships and hope, battles and blossoming love. The Caledonian Boar, uh, yes, as Miss Sky Tower said, no relation, is a ferocious wild beast able to trample a warrior to bloody rags beneath its razor hooves. The boar is the handiwork of Artemis, goddess of the moon, who created it using mud from the River of Tears. That's the River Styx. Don't pay the ferryman till they... Mm, sorry. <clears throat> Artemis created the boar, the Caledonian boar, from mud from the River of Tears, where the strong wind carries the shrieks of the tormented and hungry vultures hover like gulls. Artemis's Monster ravages the land, carrying out the vain goddess's evil plan to randomly destroy mortal after mortal after mortal after mortal. <clears throat> Meanwhile, a small child, soon to be Artemis's main rival in strength and beauty, is being raised in the hills by a family of bears. <clears throat> the wild child, Atalanta, grows into a mighty huntress who staunchly defends her family at any price which is about as far as we made it last week in the story. So tonight, when one of Atalanta's brothers is killed by Maligar, who is heir to the throne of Caledon, she becomes immense, comes immersed in a complicated struggle for love and power that involves not only Maligar and herself, but also the king and queen of Caledon, the queen's two idiot brothers, a murderous band of outlaws, and a ferocious Simba hound that becomes Maligar's ally and best friend, but at the center of it all stands the Caledonian boar. No relation. The most dangerous and threatening beast in the land. The tale of the Caledonian boar takes place in a world where no one is safe from impending evil, but is also a world in which friendships grow and hope triumphs. As a huntress and her prince bravely battle against gods and beasts in order to protect their blossoming love. So that's a wrap-up and a preview all in one. And no, there will not be a test on that. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Quargan. So we'll jump right in with the Simba Hound. Which, if you listen close in the background, I'm thinking you can hear it barking. Mm -hmm. Well, now you can make me sing. Don't do that. <laughs> Maligar awoke to the sound of his dog making a racket such as he had never heard before. Not the baying of hounds following a hot trail, nor the ragged snarl of a pack going in for the kill, but a howling chorus of pure outrage. He leapt out of bed, he rushed from the castle, ran out onto the courtyard, and across the flagged stones to the kennel. The dogs' voices changed as they heard him coming. The howls were laced with barking, which said, Let us out! Let us loose! Let us out! Let us loose! Who, who, who let the dogs out? The moon swam into a chink in the clouds, and he saw what the pack was howling at. A shape loomed near the kennels. The moonlight struck green fire from its eyes. It stood like a dog, but larger than any he had ever seen. It seemed as big as a pony. Its mouth was wrinkled back in a terrible, merciless grin. The green light of its eyes pierced Maligar's chest like twin skewers. It was a cold night. The stones felt icy beneath his bare feet, but he was boiling inside. He had to have that noble beast for his own. The wonderful power pent in that lion-like shape was meant to serve him. He knew it was. The great heart that held such ferocity must be filled with passionate obedience to him, Maligar. This giant beast, this, this incomparable... This, this was to be his dog, the dog of dogs. The gods meant it so. Why else were they created it? That's why they had sent it, wasn't it? He heard the animal snarl, a snarl that said death. Those huge jaws, those huge jaws were about to tear out his throat. Across the darkness, he could feel the whole body of the beast tensing to spring. He backed up, never taking his eyes off that giant dog, moving so swiftly and smoothly that he seemed to be sliding across the courtyard without moving his legs. Reaching behind him, he caught the edge of the kennel gate and pulled it open. The dogs came pouring out, wild to attack, but he held them with a single word, No! They looked at him in bewilderment. They couldn't believe he was calling them back from attack. He, the beloved little figure who has always led them in pell-mell chase after their prey. No! 
he said again, stand. And so they stood, but he could feel mounting force behind him, felt as if he were the frailest of dams holding back the mighty surge of a river in flood, and the huge, amazing Simba hound, who had been prepared to leap, stood also trying to understand. And what he understood was that he might kill that small morsel of a boy. They'd never get to eat him, because those other dogs loved that boy. And they would fall upon him, the attacker, and tear him to pieces. For while the Simba hound was larger and more powerful than any one of them, or any two, or probably any three, still, these were big, fierce dogs, and they would be too many for him. Nevertheless, he had never refused to fight in his life, this giant beast. He trembled with hunger and rage. Twenty pairs of eyes gleamed at him from behind the boy, as many sets of teeth flashed in the moonlight. And then amazed, he saw the boy coming toward him, heard him speak. You, big dog, accept me. We shall go hunting together. I shall show you such game as you have never known. See this splendid pack behind me. They're finest hunters in all the world. The finest hunters in all the world. And, well, you shall be their leader. You shall join your life to mine, giant dog, and we shall do nothing but hunt from morning till night. And what shall we pursue? <laughs> Not merely meat on the hoof, but we shall know such sports as the gods enjoy. Killers we shall kill. Special creatures called monsters designed to be the bane of mortal man and mortal beast. <laughs> yes, these shall we bring to bay. For such have I been promised in my dreams, which also come from the gods. So stay, big good giant dog. Let me come to you. And uh, uh, do not bite me. Now, of course, five-year-old Maleager could not say such words, nor could the great dog have understood them if he had been said. But Maleager, like all young heroes, was born with a magical lore that lived in his voice before he had the words for it. And the Simba Hound, like all the great-hearted dogs, heard meanings in the human voice beyond what any word said. And so the child crossed the courtyard, walking toward the dog, step by step his pack followed. The Simba hound growled low in his throat. The pack answered, deep growling and wrapped the boy who was walking so slowly beneath the moon. He felt he was within great vibrating bell. Danger bubbled in his blood. Made him smile. <laughs> Made him laugh. He wanted to run across the courtyard now and risking all, fling his arms about that big furry neck. But he did not. He knew enough not to make any sudden move. He glided across the flagstones, the pack keeping pace. Finally, boy and dog stood facing each other. Their heads were on a level. They stood eye to eye. Green fire mixed with hazel fire. But dogs judged by smell. And this boy cast a strange, joyous aroma. Clean wood and goose feathers of arrows. Smell of running dog and lathered horse. Cold scent of running water. A fragrance of sunshine and crushed grass, the smell of the chase, and the dog wanted that chase to start immediately. The hot rage in his own heart became a fire of comradeship. His hackles sank, he dipped his head, he put an icy nose to this little boy's face, <clears throat> and then his hot tongue. Then indeed did Maleager fling his arms about the great furry neck, press his face to the dog's muzzle, and say, I name you Alcon. He whispered into the Simba's hound's ear so that others would not grow jealous. Alcon, for Alcon, meant mighty. Now Lampon sat on a tree stump, thinking bitter thoughts as he waited for his brother. His leg was stretched straight up before him. It was bandaged from ankle to knee. He felt that the birds in the trees were jeering at him. He heard someone approaching, but he didn't look up. He knew that it was his brother, and he was too angry to look at him. Plexippus, who was indeed Lampon's brother, Plexippus spoke in a timid voice. What's the matter with your leg? Oh, nothing to trouble yourself about, said Lampon. I'll just probably be lame for the rest of my life because of that damn dog. A dog? A dog? How could that dog do it? Weren't you, weren't you wearing your armor, you idiot? Of course I was wearing my armor, 
said Lampot. A full suit of armor. It didn't seem to discourage that mutt, though. He simply knocked me to the ground and tried to bite my leg off. He, he couldn't bite through brass. Don't tell me that. He closed those awful jaws about the brass greave covering my leg. He couldn't bite through it, no, 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 but he crushed the greave. I felt like he was pulping my shin bone. The smith needed a torch to cut me loose. I had a few burns to complete, <laughs> complete my charming evening. Thank you very much. Uh, well, <clears throat> uh, well, things didn't turn out as we planned, did they? murmured Plexibus. As we planned, dear brother. Don't try to give me any credit for that plan. That was all yours, as you pointed out before we tried it. All yours, brother. And as a plan, it stank. It stank like... No, no, well, wait, wait. I'll, I'll simply think of something else, said Plexibus. We're no worse off than we were before last night. Yes, actually, we are worse off than we before we were last night said Lampon. At least I am. And as for our goal of taking over the kingdom, we're farther away than ever. It was bad enough that the king had assigned a special squadron, a royal archer, to protect the stupid little kid. But now we've helped out by providing him with a guardian worth three squadrons of archers. That savage brute, that Simba hound you came up with, is utterly devoted to that little brat. And will rip away anyone to pieces even thinks an unkind thought about the brat. Uh, yes, brother. Things did not turn out well, I admit it. Even the best generals lose a battle or two. <laughs> yes, but the best generals occasionally win one. I will find a way, said Plexippus. I promise. <laughs> That's a promise I have seemed to have heard before from you. Please, brother. I'm studying the situation from every angle. Have <clears throat> a little patience. <laughs> I've had nothing but patience, said Lampon. We're not growing any younger, you know. I'd like to dip my hands into the royal treasury while I'm still young enough to enjoy it. Don't be ridiculous. We're still quite young, both of us, and very healthy. I was a lot healthier yesterday, said Lampon. I can tell you that. I had two legs yesterday. Uh, well, I'll, <clears throat> I'll make it up to you, brother. I'll give you that slave girl I took when we raided Lemnos last month. I've seen you looking at her. Ha! <laughs> no, thank you, said Lampon. She dresses her hair with rancid butter. Have you ever passed down wind of her? Well, then take your pick. I, I have a whole string. Yes, 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 I know you do. I remember that raid. It was typical. While I was busy fighting, you were taking slaves. Hmm. I'm offering you your pick, am I not? Hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I might consider that blonde Scythian one. I was reserving her for my own use, said Plexippus. <sighs> but very well, brother. Chapter 8. A Death and a Promise For fifteen years, boy and dog were inseparable. They hunted all over Caledon and into Arcadia and Aetolia. What they chased, they caught. What they caught, they killed. Bear, wolf, wild bull, they did not care to hunt any animal that could not put up a fight for itself. When Maligar was nineteen, Alcon was fourteen, which is old for a hunting dog. He was as powerful as ever, but he had lost a lot of his speed. The boy tried not to recognize this, but he knew that his dog had slowed down and that he shouldn't be bringing his wild animals to bay. But when Maligar tried to go hunting without Elkon, the dog looked at him with such tragic eyes he didn't have the heart to leave him behind. Hey, he's bound to get himself killed this way, said Maligar to himself. But if I don't take him, he'll die of grief. Oh, and I know he'd rather go out full of excitement and joy and battle fever. Hell, I know I would. I'd much rather die fighting. So they continued to hunt together, the prince and the Simba hound. And Maligar tried not to think what had to happen. And then, tragically, one day, it did happen. They were chasing a gigantic bear up a hill. Maligar had wounded it with an arrow, but the beast seemed to be climbing very easily. Finally, it turned, backed up against a rock, and stood at bay. 
and Alcon, as if knowing this to be a special day, appeared to regain the speed of his youth and rushed up the slope in a headlong charge as if he were chasing a doe instead of a bear. He left his feet, flew through the air straight for the bear's throat. The bear hunched its huge shoulder and swung its thick paw so fast it became a blur, batting the dog to the ground in mid-leap. Alcon sprang up immediately and closed his jaws on the bear's behind leg, something he would not have done had he been able to reach higher, but he... <clears throat> he could not. His back was broken. When Eager rushed up the slope, leveling his javelin, he did not dare throw it lest he hit his dog, nor could he shoot arrows for the same reason. He was running as hard as he could, but he seemed to be going with agonizing slowness. For the bear was allowing the dog to bite on one leg, while the great talons of the other paw were ripping Alcon to shreds. By the time Allegra reached the spot, his beloved friend was a heap of fur. Forgetting all about the bear, he stooped and gathered the dog in his arms. Alcon's green eyes looked into his. They were dulling now, but still held a spark of love. A warm tongue and a cold nose in his, touched his face for the last time. The great head lulled. And then Maligar remembered the bear and sprang up, wild to kill. But the beast had sidled off. Maligar drew his sword. He meant to dig a grave. But then he shoved the sword back into his scabbard and lifted his face to the sky. No, no, he said. I won't shut him away in a dark hole. Let him abide in the open air that he loved, under the wide sky and the sun and the moon and the stars. Let his bones be plucked clean by eagle and crow and carrion worm. Aye, let his brave bones whiten on the hillside. He shall be his own tomb, and shall live always in my memory as long as I myself live. And may the gods grant me as noble a death when my time comes. His parents, the king and queen, were very worried about him. He would leave the castle at dawn and not come home until nightfall. He looked so stricken by loss that his mother couldn't stand it. She had never wanted him to marry, but had always feared the day when he would tell her that he had chosen a bride. But now, seeing, them, seeing him the way he was... She decided to speak to the king. I think, <clears throat> I think, my dear, that our boy should marry. Marry? Whom? Why, well, anyone he chooses. Why? He's still very young. Well, he needs, he needs something to make him happy, dear. Or someone, like I do for you. His heart is breaking because of that stupid dog. Nonsense, said the king. Hearts don't break so easily, and if they do, they mend themselves. Men die of sword thrust, or spear thrust, or well a marrow, or a bull, or a bull gores them, per, perchance, or a bear claws them. They do not die of grief. Only you women folk do that, and not as often as you might, as they, as they think. Hmm. Nevertheless, the king, who doted on his son almost as much as his wife did, went to Maliga and said, Son, um, I was thinking... Perhaps it's time you married. Hm, really, said Maligar. Have anyone in mind? No, but I thought you might. Caledon is famous for its beautiful girls. Maybe there is a relation. Father, please, I can't stand any of them. All the ones here are soft, squealing little things, no good with a spear or bow, hopeless on horseback. I'd, I'll not marry until I find a girl who can hunt by my side. Hmm. One that looks like a well, a bear, or I don't know. Someone who can hunt with me. Big, strong. Yes, as you like, my son. But remember this. We who are royal enjoy total privilege. One thing, however, are we are not permitted. We are not permitted to appear downhearted. Understand me, boy. We may feel grief, but not show it. For when kings weep, their tears water the seeds of fear and rage that are buried deep in the souls of those who are not kings, and these seeds ripen into revolt. You are heir to my throne, Maliga. If you would govern, smile, or your heart is breaking. Yes. Thank you, Father. I shall not um, encourage any revolting peasants. and I shall not disappoint you. He kissed his father's hand, then hurried out. Denying the bear's sister. Now Maliga returned to the hills and hunted harder than ever, but with no luck. He kept hunting. Now he camped out instead of returning to the castle after dark for some bears prowl by night, you know. 
And then finally, he spotted a bear that looked big enough. He couldn't tell whether it was the one he wanted, but he thought it might be. It was gigantic. The bear had seen him also. It stood halfway up the hill, looking down at him. Maligar tethered his horse well back among a fringe of trees and started up the hill. He was surprised the bear did not retreat. The huge beast seemed to be waiting for him, welcoming his attack. Anger flamed in Maligar. He made a great effort to control himself and advanced very cautiously. The bear backed a few steps, then wedged itself between two rocks and just waited there. The young man's hair whipped about his face. He realized that a a hard wind was blowing, a crosswind that made him hesitate to use his bow. He could hope for no accuracy in such wind, expert archer though he was, and to merely wound a bear that size, beyond cruel, would be, well, worse than useless. It would be, not be weakened, though, and pain would feed its rage, making it even more dangerous. Maligar danced about and shouted, trying to make the bear leave its shelter, trying to tempt it into charging downhill so he might use the bear's own weight against it, meet the hurtling bear point first, allowing it to impale itself upon the spear. But the bear did not judge. <sighs> Try that again. The bear did not budge, just waited there between the two rocks. It uttered a chuckling growl that sounded to Maligar as though the beast were jeering at him. More than ever, the prince was convinced that this was the bear that had killed his dog. Forgetting all about caution, he charged up the hill straight, for, straight at the rocks. The bear waited, and as soon as Maligar came within reach, swung its paw, knocking the spear out of his hand. It then charged so swiftly that the lad barely had time to draw his dagger before the beast was upon him. He saw the bear loom above him, stretch its enormous furry arms to catch him in a bone-crushing hug but to lift those heavy paws for the fatal embrace took slightly more time than if the bear had simply swung a paw knocking the youth to, to the ground, or had raked him to shreds with its claws. Maligar was just able to slip under the outstretched paws, duck behind the bear, and sink his dagger into the back of its neck, but was knocked off his feet by a backward lurch. As he sprang up, he saw it rushing away up the slope. The dagger stuck in its neck. Blood was welling from the wound. Maligar scrambled for after it. Despite its terrible wound, the beast moved slightly and was soon out of sight. Maligar followed the trail of blood, knowing that sooner or later the animal had to drop. It had been mid-morning when he fought the bear. Now the blazing summer sun was directly overhead, and he was panting as he ran. Then rounding a big boulder, he saw an astounding sight. A tall, bare-legged maiden was running down the hill with long strides. He gaped at her. She was wearing a great shaggy fur cloak, just as he thought. Why is she wearing that heavy thing in all this heat? He saw the blood was dripping on her shoulders. He realized it was not a fur cloak she was wearing, but that she was carrying a huge bear on her back, the bear that he had fought. The animal's head was lolling on her shoulder. Its blood was dripping all over her. He saw his dagger sticking out of its neck, and he stood there facing the girl. She stopped. She let the bear slide carefully to the ground. She straightened up, and she faced him. He was stunned by her beauty, standing on long, sleek, powerful legs as she was as tall as he, perhaps taller. She was clad in a brief tunic of deerskin, her red-brown hair hanging to her thighs. Her face was muddy, her bare arms and shoulders streaked with blood. He knew instantly that this was the one girl in the world for him. That's my bear, he said. But I give him to you. <sighs> your, your bear. My kill, that's my dagger, you know. I've been tracking him for hours. But you can... He was interrupted by her coarse cry of rage. Ah! Of all the car, you... She stooped, scooped up a huge log as if it were a stick, and hurled it at his head. He ducked, but he felt it graze his hair. She bent again and pulled the dagger from the bear's neck, then came slowly toward him. This bear is my brother, you murdering savage! You have killed my brother, and now I, I shall kill you. Uh, ah, sweet maiden! Sweet! Sweet is it! I'm as bitter as death, you'll find! Pick up your spear and fight! He picked up his spear... He threw it in the same motion. It cut through the air and it split a sapling neatly in two. He turned and stood facing her with empty hands. 
You'll need a weapon, she said. I mean to kill you. Um, I understand that. Come ahead. Try. Use the dagger if you like. It'll make things more even. She howled with fury and flung the dagger away. Do me no favors, she cried. I'll kill you with my bare hands. Bare hands? Bare legs? Hmm. She rushed at him. <clears throat> he caught her arms, trying to hold her back gently. It was impossible. She was as strong as a wild mare. She caught him in a great bear hug. He felt his ribs being crushed. Kicking, twisting, he broke her hold, then closed with her. There on the hillside, under a hot sun, before the dead eyes of the bear, they wrestled. Atalanta was a powerful fighter. Adopted by a she-bear, she had grown up among bears, running with them, hunting with them, wrestling with them. She had grown into a gloriously tanned, supple young woman, strong as a she-bear herself. More than once she had taken a wild bull by its horns and twisted off its hooves, so she was sure she could overcome Maligar easily. She planned to crush him in her hug and hurl him off the cliff. However, as she wrestled with him under the sun, in the fragrance of trampled grass and pine needles, something new began to happen. Now, as we all know, when wrestling shaggy bears, she had been puzzled that her own arms and legs seemed so smooth against their fur. She had wondered all her life why she was so different from her brethren and sistren, and didn't know whether she was glad or sorry. But now, as Atalanta held the young man in her mighty hug, she smelt she felt his smoothness. It was as though she were holding herself, so that his body, this body that was strange, so strange to her, was also wonderfully familiar. Trying to crush him in her arms, she found that she no longer knew where her body ended and his began. It seemed to her then that the, the fragrance of the trampled grass was rising in a sweet mist, robbing her of sense. She was dizzy. Her knees sagged. She, who could run up the side of a mountain, leaping from rock to rock, catching mountain goats in full stride, unbelievable to feel her legs weakening now. Her mind swooped and darkened and cast up a last thought. It's magic. He's, he's fighting me with, with, with magic. When her head cleared, she found they were sitting on, a, on the ground, their backs against an olive tree near the edge of the cliff, and looking on to a great scoop of blueness where a black hawk floated. Their arms were wrapped about each other's bodies as though they were still wrestling. She was telling her name. <clears throat> I am Atlanta. Ah, Atalanta. I belong to the clan of mountain bears. I am Maligar, he said. I belong to you. Two Jealousies, Chapter 10 So the Prince of Calvadon found the mate he had dreamed of. They hunted together, over hill and over valley, through forest and field and swamp, on foot and on horseback, with dog pack or with long-legged Egyptian hunting cats called cheetahs. But more often they went out by themselves, for they preferred to be alone. Now Plexippus was pleased by what was happening. He went to Lampon and said, I have a plan, brother. No, no, don't tell me. Another one. A plan. A plan. He has a plan. Oh, I hope it's better than the ones you've had before. Oh, it is, it is. Oh, I'm sure it is, brother, said Lampon. It would have to be, wouldn't it? Your record's so bad that all you can do is improve. Oh, do you want to hear my plan or not? What's the difference? I'll hear it whether I want to or not. I'm setting no more physical traps for the lucky prince, said Plexippus. All his life he's dwelt in the protection of his parents' love, but now, 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 ha, 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 I have the brilliant idea of turning that love against him. At least I'll turn his mother's, and she's more important in this matter than her husband. Your raving brother, said Lampon, our sister dotes on her son. Nothing you can say or do can turn her against him. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But it is her love itself that I will curdle, I tell you. She has always been ready to be jealous of any girl he might want to marry. And I am talking about eligible girls, yes? 
heavily dowered princesses and so forth. Imagine how she must feel about him, wantoning about with his barefooted mountain slut. Well, <laughs> I mean to fan the flames of that. He left his brother and stalked off to find his sister. At first he chatted of this and that, and Althea was only half listening to him, as was her habit. Then he said, I heard an interesting <clears throat> tale, sister. I heard that this new friend of Maligar belong, belongs to a clan of mountain nymphs who hold a various curious custom. It seems that they put their suitors through a courtship test, yes? Each one of these nymphs demands of their suitor that he prove his love by cutting out his mother's heart and bringing it to her as a gift. <laughs> oh, I don't believe the tale, of course, sister dear. Um, but I thought it was strange enough to tell it to you. Oh, thank you, said Althea and turned away. But he had caught the look in her eyes before her face was hidden by her hair. He strolled off, smiling to himself. Now, Althea nursed her grief in solitude. She knew how malicious her brother was. She didn't really trust anything, he said. Nevertheless, his words had found their mark. Her beloved son was tearing her heart out, if not literally with a knife, and by neglecting her for the sake of that wild wench from the hills. And Althea, in her jealousy, forgot that Maligar, who had been so sad after the death of his dog, now glowed with happiness. All she could think of was that her lovely boy had no thought for his mother any more, only for that long-legged huntress. As it happened, though, the beautiful couple had aroused the jealousy of someone more powerful than Althea. For the folk of Caledon, who had glimpsed Atalanta and Malaga running across a field in the morning mist or seen them silhouetted against the sunset, began to whisper that their prince had found a goddess to be his mate. No one knew her name, but it was certain that she was a goddess, for she was as tall and strong and fleet as Artemis herself, and perhaps, perhaps even more beautiful. Now these whispers drifted up to Artemis, goddess of the chase, lady of the silver bow, and she burned with rage. She had always considered herself the fairest of the goddesses, more beautiful in her opinion than Aphrodite, goddess of love and beauty. Oh, yes, she far preferred her own lithe, suavely muscled figure to that of the lazy, wide-hipped Aphrodite, and to have a mere human girl compared to her made her blaze with fury. I will show them that there is only one Artemis, she cried. I'll send them such game as they'll never forget. And she whistled up the monstrous boar that she made of the Stygian mud. Yes, eighteen chapters in, we're finally getting to the boar. Out of the steaming jungle of Central Africa, this giant boar came, charted around the rim of North Africa going west, then plunged into the waters of the Middle Sea and headed north towards Spain. As it swam, it amused itself by killing a shark or two and mangling a few giant squid. It climbed ashore on the Horn of Spain, galloped overland, then eastward to the great peninsula we now call Greece. Slipped through there, and Artemis guided her monster pig through Euboea and Boeotia, through Mycenae and Achaea and Arcadia, not letting it stop until it reached the lush, hilly land called Baba Caledon. And the instructions she gave it were, Kill, kill, kill! Chapter 11, The Monster. That's the monster. The monster boar, Caledon boar, immediately began to spread terror throughout the land. It uprooted trees, it dug up crops, it killed horses and cattle and those who tended them. It attacked men and women working in fields, punching holes in them with its tusk, troubling them under its razor-sharp hooves until they were just bloody rags. Nor was there any way to escape it when it was on a rampage, for it would hurtle into a house, knocking it to splinters, then kill everyone inside. Shepherds and cowherds were afraid to graze their flocks. Farmers refused to harvest their crops. And so the people began to go hungry. The king didn't know what to do. He asked Maligar's advice. The young man was wild with excitement. Father, father, father. <laughs> oh, oh, dear father, I'll kill the boar. You alone, son? 
Oh, just I, myself, and one other. Are you mad? We can do it, father. We can kill any beast ever born. Any beast. No. No, my son, this is no ordinary boar. It's no ordinary beast. This is a monster. It's huge, incredibly strong, totally murderous. It's a monster, I say. I'm afraid we have offended some god who has sent this beast to ravage the land. I don't understand it. I always sacrifice regularly to every one of the gods. Nevertheless, we have been cursed, and this dreadful beast roams the country, destroying, killing. Oh, but I must hunt him, father. This is the quarry we have dreamed of, something at, le at last worthy of our skills. I forbid it, cried the king. You are my only son. If you are killed... The throne will fall to your mother's idiot brothers, who will stuff into their pockets all that is left by ravaged land. No, no, no. You shall not risk your life this way. The beast must be killed, father, or there will be no kingdom for you to rule or for me to inherit. Yes, 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 yes we must contend with the monster, no doubt about that. But you shan't do it alone, or if that huntress of yours. We need a regular war party to go against this monster. What we shall do is invite all the best fighters in the lands of Middle Sea to hunt the beast. They're all a little crazy, like you, these heroes, and are always looking for a challenge. Well, <laughs> yes, they will have one. It will be a famous affair. Mm. Call whom you like, sire. But I shall lead the hunt, said Maliga. Whereupon messages were sent to the greatest warriors of the Hellenic lands, inviting them to Caledon to hunt the giant boar, those who weren't too busy killing each other except with the invitation. Kings, princes, pirates, warlords, robbers, chieftains, they, they all came flocking into Caledon. The king was old now, however, and uneasy about playing host to so many rambunctious warriors. I won't be able to go with them, he said to his wife. The leaguer will have to do the honors while I stay home to guard the castle. Why must you guard it? asked his queen. Don't you trust your guests? Well, I trust them to act like themselves. They didn't become so rich in land and cattle by buying them, my dear. These men have always taken what they wanted, and they may see in this enfeebled kingdom only a chance for booty. Well, you must do what you think best, dear, said the queen. I don't know what I think best. Sometimes I think this, sometimes that. I fear our guest as much as I do the boar, yet my heart tells me that my son may die in this hunt and that I should ride with him. Oh, well, you need not fear for your son, said Althea. <laughs> our son. The fates themselves permit me to guard his life. Fates? What fates? Hmm? Where? How? What do you mean? Whereupon she told her husband how, upon the hour of Maniger's birth, she had been visited by Atropos, the lady of the shears. She told him how the hag had thrown a stick into the fire, and how she, Althea, had leapt from the bed to snatch it out of the fire. And how Atropos had promised that while the brand remained unburned, the prince would not die. Bah! You expect me to believe this rigmarole? cried the king. Hags, sticks, promises. We can't risk our son's life on such nonsense. You be careful what you call nonsense, dear, said Althea. You're in enough trouble now without offending the eldest fate. Bah! Prove that it's not nonsense! Behold! cried Althea. She unlocked the great brass chest. She lifted its lid and showed him the charred stick. The king was still disinclined to believe, to acquiesce, as it were. But looking at the blackened branch and studying his wife's face, he knew that she was speaking the truth. Well, well, I see. So set your mind at rest, my dear. Dear husband, let him lead the hunt while you stay here and guard the castle. Besides, I'm sending my brothers to keep an eye on him. Ha! <laughs> your idiot brothers! Who will keep an eye on them? Stop it, please. I already know your opinion of my brothers, but they'll be more careful than you about certain matters. They'll carry out my wishes and prevent him from bringing that wild hussy of his to join the hunt. You're very wrong to interfere, said the king. But Leaguer loves that girl and will never love another. Love, 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 love. What does he know about love? That stripling with his mother's milk scarcely dry on his lips. I tell you that he shall never bring her home as his wife, not while I draw breath. Well, you can't worry about that at the moment, said the king. I have heavier things in my mind. 
monstrous beasts, fearsome guests. The wild girl will have to wait. Hmm. She'll wait long before she marries my son, said Althea. Early the next morning, everyone gathered for the hunt. The guests were astounded when Maliga rode up with Atalanta at his side. They goggled in wonder at the lovely, lithe young huntress who sat a great gray horse. She was clad in deerskin tunic, wore bow and quiver, and held a javelin. All of them were surprised. Some of them were angered at the thought that Maliger was taking the hunt lightly, and some younger ones were inflamed by her beauty and growing jealous of Maliger. The couple sat their horses solidly. Maliger was stone-faced, Atalanta smiling. The prince's uncles rode toward him. You're disgracing us, croaked Plexippus, and dishonoring our noble guest. They do not wish to ride out with his bears or whelp from their hills. Maliger touched his horse with his heels. He walked it between his uncle's horses. He grasped an arm of each, squeezing them until he felt their elbows crack in his iron grip. One more insulting word out of you, he whispered, and I'll call off this hunt and send everyone away. And Atalanta and I will hunt the boar alone, as we have always wished. But first, First, my dear uncles, I will smash your heads together so that our guests may see where the fault lies. The uncles were silent then. Maliger lifted his horn and sounded a call that rang through the hills, laughing, shouting, arms glistening. The company rode forth to hunt the boar. They did not ride far. The boar came to meet them. It selected its position very cannily, choosing a canyon where the walls narrowed so that it could be attacked only from the front by no more than two men at a time. As for these were expert hunters, Maliger did not have to guide them by hand signals. They knew what to do. They did not rush into attack, but strung themselves out before the mouth of the canyon. They pranced and shouted, clashed spear against shield, trying to excite the boars who would charge out of the canyon. <laughs> it did not. They advanced, shouting more loudly, beat their shields harder, no movement from the boar. The uncles had not advanced. They had reined their horses well away from the canyon and were watching from afar. The men were losing their caution now. They advanced within a spear's throw of the canyon mouth, and then, although the beast was half hidden in a tangle of brush, they sent a flight of arrows into its hiding place. They were determined to draw the beast out. It was simply too dangerous to go into that narrow cleft after it. They came closer, and they sent another flight of arrows into the brush. This time they succeeded. In their success... <laughs> their success was a disaster. They had underestimated the monster's size and speed. Oh, it came out all right. It came hurtling out of the canyon with the crushing force of a boulder rolling down a mountainside. It charged into a party of hunters, scattering them in all directions, and it whirled lightly as a panther, trampling two of the men to bloody shreds under its razor hooves. The hunters fled. The boar followed. It caught two of them, spearing one with its tusk, shearing his leg off of the hip. Another warrior... The two warrior brothers, Telamon, who became the father of Ajax, and Peleus, who has become the father of Achilles, showed their enormous courage by walking slowly in on the boar, spears out thrust. Their example inspired others to form a ragged circle about the oar, boar. But the beast charged Telamon, breaking through a hedge of spears. Peleus flung his javelin, it skidded off the boar's shoulder, pierced one of the hunters who fell dead. Another man swung his battle axe at the boar, it tilted its head, parrying the axe, then with a savage counter-thrust ripped open the man's belly, gutting him like a fish. The beast was then charged Peleus, who would have died on the spot, leaving no son named Achilles, and Hector might have lived, and Troy stood unburned. <clears throat> so much for Helen. But Atalanta drew her bow and loosed a shaft into the unprotected spot behind the boar's ear. The arrow sank in up to its feathers, any other animal would have been killed instantly, but the boar still lived and seemed as strong as ever, murderously strong. Howling with pain, it chased, chased Atalanta. She did not flee, though. She notched another arrow and stood facing the beast as it rushed upward toward her. There was just enough time for it to send an arrow into its eye, but it kept hurling toward her. Maliger, shouting a war cry, flung himself right into the boar's path, hurling a javelin as he ran. It sank into the boar under its shoulder, turning it from its course. Now it rushed toward Maliger who kept running toward it and leaped clear of it over the charging beast like a cretin bull or dancer. He landed behind it. Before the boar could turn, he swung his sword in a glittering arc, slashing under the great hump of muscle, cutting the spinal cord. The massive low-slung body tottered, tilted, fell. Even that incarnation of monstrous energy could not 
live after the cable of its life was cut. The boar lay dead. A great cheer went up from the bloody batter crowd of the hunters. Maligard nodded at them, pulled out his knife, knelt at the side of the giant carcass, and calmly began to skin it. When he was finished, he came to Atalanta with the pelt in his arms, and he bowed and said, Your arrow struck first, my lady. The hide belongs to you. Now this boar hide made a priceless gift. It was so tough that it made a wonderful, flexible battle garment, lighter and stronger than armor, able to turn wolf, bite, spear, thrust, flying arrow. <clears throat> Plexippus, who had hung back from the actual fighting, of course, and hadn't come anywhere near the boar, of course, sensed that the other hunters might resent Malager giving this splendid trophy to the girl and decided to take advantage of this resentment. He rode toward Malager, beard bristling, lamp and joined him. What kind of hospitality is this, O oh nephew? he cried. It would be unprincely, of course, for you to claim the hide for yourself, though you killed the boar. But the least you can do is offer it to one of your distinguished guests. Then he turned upon Atalanta, spittle flying from his lips as he berated her. And you, you're a vile witch. You have cast enchantments upon this poor lad. His wits are rattled. He doesn't know what he's doing. Give that hide back instantly, or you'll regret it. The leaguer was listening quietly. He wiped the blood from his sword with a handful of dry grass. He studied the gleaming blade, then swung it twice. Whoosh! Whoosh! The heads of his uncles fell in the dust, so quickly parted from their necks that they seemed still seemed to be cursing as they fell. The guests were stunned. Malager turned to them and said, <clears throat> I beg you, kind sirs, to pardon this unpleasant family brawl. However, if any of you perchance feels too much offended, I shall be glad to measure swords with him. If not, you are all invited to the castle to feast celebrating the death of the boar and honoring the fair huntress Atalanta, whom I intend to make my wife. The hunters raised a great shout. Some of them may have been angry, others jealous, but they all admire courage when, they, when it showed itself. Besides, none of them were too eager to fight Malager. They had seen him in action, and so they all rode toward the castle, all but Atalanta and Malager, who excused themselves and rode off to uh, be alone for a few hours before the festivities began. When the hunters reached the castle, they were <clears throat> met by the king and queen, who eagerly demanded to hear their tale. Peleus, who was their spokesman more or less, told of the fight with the boar, how some of the party had been killed, others wounded, how Atalanta had shot an arrow into the boar, drawing first blood, and would have been killed herself had not Malager rushed into the beast's path and slain it with his sword. But when it was told how Malager had presented the boar's hide to Atlanta, how his uncles had protested and been beheaded for their trouble, then the queen went white with fury and left the room. She went to her chamber and sank to her knees on the stone floor that was covered by the skins of the animals Malager had slain, wolfskin, bearskin. She had always trod them with pleasure because he had given them to her. She tried to picture her son Malager's face. She tried to remember how much she loved him for she was shocked now by her own feelings. She could not believe the intention that was forming within her. No, no, curse me, no, she cried. I love him, I love my son. And then she heard her brother's voice saying, Curious tales of these mountain nymphs. Seems that before one of them will accept a suitor, he has to cut out his mother's heart and bring it to her as a gift. Althea walked at her knees to the brass chest. She leaned her arms upon it and buried her face in her arms, sobbing. Bad prince, cruelest of sons, you have sent my two brothers to Tartarus and in their stead proposed to bring home this wild nymph of the hills. It shall not be my son, now my enemy. The lady of the shears has given your mother the power to prevent you. Mad with grief, Althea flung open the brass chest. She pulled the charred stick from its place and threw it on the fire and watched it burn. Now, while this was happening, Malager and Atlanta were in their favorite place under the twisted olive tree in the cliff, looking out into the great blue gulf of space. I want to be your wife, murmured Atalanta. You're the only one I've ever loved or ever shall love. But, my dearest, I don't want to. I can't. I, 
I don't want to live in a castle. I don't want to be a queen and wear dresses and sit on a throne. Why can't we stay the way we are? Roaming the hills, hunting, fighting. Oh, can't we? We will, we will, cried Malager. King and queen we must be, but for every day we spend indoors sitting on thrones, making laws and so forth, for every day spent so poorly, I promise you, we shall spend ten days riding, hunting, fighting, you and I together, side by side. This is my solemn vow, Atalanta. Atalanta, my lovely one. And this I swear to... Oh! Oh! <gasps> She heard his voice stop. She saw him clutch his chest. She saw Maligar's eyes bulge, his face go purple. She caught him in her arms. His head snapped back, his scorched lips parted. He uttered a scalding cry of agony as his hair caught fire. She tried to bat out the flames, but only burned her hands. It was no use. It was no use. Maligar was dead. His charred body smoldered on the grass. In the castle, Queen Althea scattered the, sa the ashes of the burnt stick with her foot, stamping out the last spark. Then she straightened her robes, combed her hair with a silver comb, and went down to tend to her guests. Ah, but the moon goddess, for all her power, had failed. Her boar was dead while her rival still lived, and although Atalanta wished she had died with Maligar, life ran too richly in the tall girl for her to kill herself. She left Caledon and went back to Arcadia, where she had been born. And wherever she went, legend attended her. Poseidon, it is told, glimpsed her running along the shore one day, fell violently in love with her, and gave her name to his most important ocean, an Artemis whose jealousy has not cooled after all these thousands of years, still instructs her moon to swing the Atlantic tides very roughly, making it the most feared of all the oceans. And so that's the Caledonian boar, as recreated by Bernard Evelyn. I hope you guys enjoyed. I think these are a lot of fun. Um... In fact, I think they're so much fun, I thought I'd do another one for you next week called The Nemean Lion.